Welcome to the Way of the Dad podcast, where we fearlessly dive into the depths of dadness. If you like what you are hearing, please share the podcast and give it a review on the platform where you listen. Thank you. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you all had a great New Year's. Hope everything was safe for you all. And uh want to bring you in on this episode. This is going to be uh, kind of a, uh, well, very much a last minute and definitely not pre-planned recording. But you're going to get a two for today, this Monday. I already have episode four scheduled to drop. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and tag this one right along in with it because it's a great New Year. And it's a great day to be a Bengals fan. My Cincinnati Bengals won the AFC North today. And I couldn't be more ecstatic. You know, you might you might be able to tell uh, that my voice is a little on the horse side. Um, recently, me and my wife, we went on a vacation to Huntsville, Alabama, which I will be talking about that. Highly recommend the place real quick. And uh, allergies kind of got the best of me. And so I've been kind of dealing with a uh, a voice, uh, you know, vocal cords, back of my throat being a little on the dry and hoarse and raspy side because, you know, you get that wonderful uh, drainage going down the back of your throat. And uh, my voice was on the recovery until today. So uh, I don't know how long this episode's going to be, but I wanted to talk about it because I have been a uh, pretty much a lifelong Bengals fan since I was about eight years old. Uh, when I was old enough to pay attention and notice that the Bengals were back in 88, man, they, <laughs> that was about as good as it got. You know what I mean? You know, I, I, of course, suffered badly through the 90s. And, uh, and then Marvin Lewis came to town and Carson Palmer was drafted and the Bengals stopped being a total joke. Now, unfortunately, that whole, era did not live up to, uh, in my opinion, what it could have been and what I think it was heading towards. Palmer's knee injury seemed to derail it, but also drafting some poor character people who took away not only on the field from the Bengals at times when they had a victory seemingly wrapped up, but also uh, off the field. And unfortunately, I honestly couldn't blame Palmer as much as a Bengals fan as I am, I couldn't blame him when he decided that he was going to put it to him and say, look, you're either going to trade me or I'm going to retire. And he didn't bluff, or he didn't blink, I should say, when they called his bluff. But the Bengals were able to do something at that point, moving on from the Palmer era, that a lot of teams don't get to do. And the Bengals definitely didn't get this during the 90s is they were able to transition from one franchise quarterback to another with the drafting of, uh, obviously, Andy Dalton in the second round, but then A.J. Green is a compliment to him in the first round. Uh, I'll probably say something that some people would disagree with, is that Andy Dalton wasn't a bum. He wasn't a terrible quarterback. And it's like something I said on the Matrix Resurrections review, but he was just fine. That's what Andy Dalton was. He's an extraordinarily good guy, did a lot in the community, but on the field, he was just good to sometimes pretty good, depending on who his uh, supporting cast was. But Andy Dalton was never going to be, and I think after about the second or third season, it became really obvious that he kind of just had a little bit of a ceiling, that he wasn't going to be able to hit that next gear. Me had a little bit of a gamer mentality but he just wasn't going to be able to hit that next gear. So, unfortunately, you know, his time in Cincinnati ended kind of very poorly. And I'm not going to sit here and say I was a big fan of how his time ended here. I have been critical of Zach Taylor at times. Um, I've been critical of the front office many times. But it was pretty obvious that his time here was going to be coming to an end with a new coach coming in 
and a new coach wants to get their quarterback. And boy, did we. Oh boy, oh boy. Uh, it was pretty obvious from the get-go that Burrow was a whole different beast. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that I knew from the first game that he was going to be great, but I knew he had another level to him that, unfortunately, Andy didn't. And in some ways, Palmer didn't. Palmer definitely had the physical skill set uh, as far as arm, and he could read defenses and everything, but he also didn't really have the leadership thing. They always talked about how he was a quiet leader. After you've heard that a few times, you start wondering, like, hmm, I, I, I don't know how many quiet leaders I've ever been around. Now, you shouldn't be a yeller and a thrower, you know, throwing things, yelling. And, but if you're a quiet leader, I don't know how good of a leader you are, especially in, in, in football. So it was pretty obvious that we got something special there, although obviously last year the Bengals were extremely limited. The offensive line play was extremely poor. And then Burrow goes down with a knee injury. And our worst fears as Bengals fans come to fruition. Right there on TV, you're just watching it happen. And your heart just sinks. But if I'm choosing to look at this from an optimistic perspective, and I am, I've always been a firm believer in that everything happens for a reason. You can assign whatever you want to that. but. I don't know if Burrow didn't go down like that, and not that I would ever say that it was great, but we might not have Jamar Chase, and wow. So, me and my friend Dave, we were watching the game today, and we were jumping all over the place, and I kind of knew somewhere around end of the third quarter, of course it didn't look good in the beginning, but around the end of the third quarter, I looked over to my buddy and I said, you know, no matter what happens today, I know I won't be hearing any national pundits saying that, oh, see, Cincinnati's not good enough to hang with the big boys. Oh, see, Cincinnati's not, they're not good enough, they're not ready yet, they're just not ready for prime time. I've been hearing it all through the Dalton years, I heard it through the end of the Palmer years, and, I mean, you didn't hear it during the 90s because no one bothered to talk about the Bengals during the 90s, pretty much. But I knew we weren't going to be talked about like that today, no matter what happened. I've been plenty critical of Zach Taylor and his play calling at times, but I do feel like I have seen a coach grow and learn and not, or at least try not to make the same mistake twice, which is something I'm big about just as a parent is with my kids is, okay, you made a mistake. Great. Okay. There's punishment. You know, there's a price for that, whatever. But now what are you learning? What are you taking from this? You got to do the autopsy on the mistake. You got to do the investigation. You got to go back and take a look at it. Or in this case, you got to go back to the film room from a football perspective and see where did you make mistakes at? What can you do better? And I will say that I feel like Zach Taylor has grown as a head coach and as a play caller. And, you know, I know it could have bit us at the end, but I absolutely respected the fact that he went for it on fourth down twice at the end. I respected the heck out of that because that takes a seriously large amount of cojones. And I think everybody knows what that means. Just try not to say it. (laughs) Let's just say those cojones are made of brass and they were sparking a lot because if it didn't work and we lost, he had to know that he was going to get absolutely run over the coals for it. But he had a lot of faith in his offense, and he had a lot of faith in his defense, especially if the offense couldn't pull it off. And I I respect that let's go win this game. I know some people like to rip John Harbaugh of the Ravens for going for two, and maybe he hasn't always picked the best times to go for two, but I respect the let's go for the win, not the tie. I respect the heck out of that. I mean, the stats from this game are just absolutely bonkers. I mean, we saw... I'm not going to say they're the two best quarterbacks in the league. I'm going to say they're two of the best quarterbacks in the league, which I don't think anybody in their right mind would challenge. You saw two of the best quarterbacks in the league play some insane football today. Now, I'm a little partial to <laughs> I'm a little partial to my Bengals, but I mean, this is ridiculous. Joe Burrow, 30 of 39, 446 yards, four touchdowns. 
and four bonkers touchdowns. It almost needs an asterisk next to it because almost none of those touchdowns were run-of-the-mill type stuff. Even the one Tyler Boyd was kind of crazy because Tyler Boyd had to drag that toe. If he didn't drag that toe, that wasn't a touchdown. And it was, I mean, it was absolute pitch perfect footing, footwork, hands, everything. And there was no way anybody else could get it but Tyler Boyd right there. But now that I got Tyler Boyd out of the way, Jamar Chase, the man who should be the offensive rookie of the year, running away. You want to throw a couple votes to some other, you know, rookies? Fine. Jamar Chase should absolutely be winning that title. It's not even close. He's had a little bit of a downtime because they defensive coordinators finally started realizing, oh yeah, we can't put just one guy on Jamar Chase. It tends to not go well. And then they had to make some adjustments, and Jamar Chase really has popped right back up. The last two weeks, absolutely insane, astounding numbers. A lot of people want to kind of um, ignore the Ravens' win last week because, well, they're playing with a depleted secondary and all this other stuff and practice squad players. Well, they're still NFL players, and don't get me wrong, I understand. They're not your starters for a reason, usually because they're not as good. But that's fine. You want to ignore that game? That's fine. Let's look at this one. Jamar Chase's numbers were even better today. Even better. 11 receptions, 266 yards, and three bonkers touchdowns. At least two of them were for sure. I'm trying to remember the third one right now. Three touchdowns, 266 yards. Do you know that Jamar Chase had more yards catching the ball than Patrick Mahomes had passing it? And Patrick Mahomes did not have a bad day. This is not to slight Patrick Mahomes at all. I have a lot of respect for that quarterback. I may not like that sometimes he always seems like he's looking for a flag or a penalty when it really wasn't there. But, hey, look, you're supposed to you're supposed to fight for your own team. I get that. So, Patrick Mahomes had 259 yards passing, and Jamar Chase had seven more yards than that catching. I mean, absolutely unreal. You know, the throw to Chase, which looked like it was going to be kind of a standard, let's get the first down type throw, where Jamar Chase ends up stunting out and, and spinning out, and then ends up absolutely outrunning the entire rest of the KC defense. It, like they went to a track meet and they forgot that, oh, yeah, this it's like Usain Bolt was there. He absolutely outpaced them. It was just phenomenal. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, (laughs) sometimes it defies words because as a Bengals fan, we haven't had a lot to talk about, at least not since 88. We haven't had a lot to talk about. Now we had some great receiving cores, trios, I'll call them trios. Let's call them trios. Uh, during the Palmer years. I mean, we had the trio during the Palmer years, Chad Johnson, Hushman Zada, and most of the time it was Chris Henry, uh, for at least the notable years. And Chad Johnson and Hush Mazzotta are absolutely Cincinnati Bengal Ring of Honor type people. I mean, they did stuff that broke records, at least for the team. Now, I'm not saying Hall of Fame. I think that's a higher standard, and I'm not saying that uh, I think I think Chad Johnson probably should be eventually a candidate for the Hall of Fame, but mostly because of his individual production and, it, quite frankly, his ability, which was uh, he, he was the kind of guy who would just you know, put his foot in the ground and take and like turn. I know that the term is overused, turning on a dime, but he would literally do that. And the defenders sometimes would damn near almost come out of their cleats to try to change direction to come get him or to stay with him. Hushman Zada was an absolute workhorse. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who would go out and catch a ball. It didn't matter where you put it, where you wanted him to run his round. He'd go catch that ball. He was, he was the guy who had the sure hands. He was the dependable guy. He was. He was normally what a tight end is for most teams today. He was the guy that you knew was going to go get that ball. During the Dalton years, honestly, the best trio that we ever had that I, I can think of uh, was A.J. Green, Marvin Jones, and Mohamed Sanu, and unfortunately that was a, a short term for that trio. Pretty awesome while it was there, but 
it didn't last long enough. But now you've got Tyler Boyd who is, I mean, he is absolutely dependable. He is as dependable as the sun coming up in the morning and going down in the evening. I mean, like saying Tyler Boyd's going to go catch a ball is like saying water's wet. You just know it's true. You've got Higgins, who he's had a little up and down this year, but he's had a really good year, and he's got hands. Watch him catch a ball. They're with his hands. He doesn't use his body. Not unless he absolutely has to. But he prefers to go catch that ball with his hands. And once he's got that ball, it almost seems it's like it's impossible for someone to knock it out. And Jamar Chase is just absolutely bonkers crazy talented. It's just absolutely mind-boggling to watch sometimes. Joe Mixon has been an absolute rock for this team. I mean, absolute rock. And you've got someone who back there who, I, I swear, he is literally making everybody better by being around him. And I know it sounds like I'm gushing, and I am a little bit. But it's hard not to when you've seen, we had a legitimately great player in Carson Palmer. But there was a little something missing. We had a pretty good quarterback in Andy Dalton. But there was definitely some things missing. And I, now I am not an expert on the Ken Anderson era. I do know he was really great uh, for the organization. I, as much as I came around to the Bengals during the Boomer Sison era, unfortunately that era didn't last very long either. And Boomer was pretty awesome, but I don't think he had the physical skill sets that we're talking about with Burrow. You're talking about being around someone who, I mean, you're talking about a quarterback who actually makes the defense better in some ways. I can't tell you where I saw this article talking about where Joe Burrow and his effect that he's had on the defense, but it is true. A great quarterback can have an effect on the defense because the defense knows that, hey, the offense can go do their job and that sometimes that allows the defense to pin their ears back and go after the quarterback a little bit more. They can play with a little more swagger, a little more confidence, and to know that, hey, sometimes if we don't get the job done, we know the offense is going to back us up. But I, I'm just <laughs> I'm just sitting here in absolute awe. I mean, look, I, I know that Pittsburgh's on the decline. Thankfully. Sorry, Steelers fans. Nothing personal, but it doesn't hurt this Bengals fan's feelings that you guys are finally on the decline a little bit. I think the Browns are kind of sort of a mess. They're a hot mess. And even though Baker's never really been my cup of tea, I do think he's a a, a legitimate starting quarterback. Um, I think he has the potential for greatness, but his a lot of people call it cockiness. And uh, while he is cocky at times, and everybody says, oh, he plays with a chip on his shoulder. Well, I've seen players with play play with a chip on their shoulder. Aaron Rodgers plays with one. Tom Brady's played with one probably since before he was even drafted, sixth round. And Joe Burrow definitely plays with a chip on his shoulder. And I don't I do not mean to make the equation that Joe Burrow is just as good as or will be when when it's all said and done. I sure hope so. But I'm talking about type, not necessarily equating to results. Just type of player. Baker Mayfield seems to me like someone who lets his cockiness go over the line or lets that chip on his shoulder actually become an anchor holding him back. He spends too much time being offended by what somebody said here, what somebody said here, or some pundit said, instead of just taking it and turning it all inside and using that to sharpen yourself and to get better. And I apologize if you hear any planes flying overhead. Apparently, Amazon Air is going crazy out here in the uh, northern Kentucky area. But uh, they must be, I don't, I don't know, DHL, Amazon Air, God knows. So, and the Ravens, hey, look, they're a good team. Especially when they're healthy. They're a legitimately good team. But it didn't hurt my feelings to see them get spanked by twice this year. And I'm sorry, but you can complain all you want. Ravens fans, sorry. But hey, what happened the first time we saw you this year and Lamar Jackson was healthy. He was perfectly fine. We bottled him up all day. So, I normally don't use the we, but it felt good there. Uh, it is an absolute phenomenal day to be a Bengals fan. 2021 
AFC North champions. And if uh, everything I've heard from Joe Burrow and the rest of the team and Zach Taylor and all the leaders on that team, they do not plan on this being the end of it. Burrow said many times he doesn't care about, you know, division crowns. He wants championships with a capital C. And I don't know if we're going to get there this year, but I know one thing for sure. I am absolutely going to enjoy finding out. This is the best Bengals team I have ever seen in my life, short of 88. It's not even close. I'm sure that might rouse some people up. And I'm sure some people have some opinions, which I hope you do. So feel free to uh, hit me up with those comments. So the Facebook page is live, uh, Way of the Dad, on Facebook. I think it's Way of the Dad podcast, actually. <clears throat> um, you can obviously uh, hit some comments up there. YouTube page is live. So these are co- cross-posted on YouTube. Uh, they're an audio-only format. Uh, Castos does this thing where they do a static image, but it creates an audio-only format with just like a static image for the video side of things. And um, showing up on Google Podcasts now, showing up on Audible. I don't know about Apple yet. I'm still waiting to hear when they're going to finally let this ride on theirs. I don't know. I did whatever they wanted me to do, so. Uh, hoping to find it on, you know, some other places like, uh, you know, Stitcher and, uh, Spotify and everything. Still waiting for the Spotify one. I think, I can't remember if Spotify's up yet or not. Um, but the RSS feed is finally starting to get out there a little bit. Of course, there is also a website if you want to listen directly from the website. And it is www.wayofthedadpodcast with hyphens or dashes, sorry, dashes in between. So it's way dash of dash the dash dad dash podcast dot castos, C-A-S-T-O-S dot com. So you can find it there. Please leave me comments. Please like, subscribe, and please share if you enjoy this content. Um, I do plan to grow the podcast eventually. I do plan to have some advertisement sounds wrong, but like uh, there's a there's a term for it where, you know, I get you a, a discount. And if you go use that discount, I get a little something from wherever you shop. I try to do a little research and try to make sure I get some things that are actually good and useful and desirable. But I I appreciate everybody who's listening. I appreciate everybody, you know, who has tried to help me get this off the ground and going. I don't intend to stop, even if I'm talking to dead air out there. I don't care. I'm going to keep it up. And I hope you're along for the ride. And if you have any suggestions of things that you'd like to hear me talk about, the best way to tell me that is at wayofthedadpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, just send it direct to the email. I will definitely get that. And I would love any show ideas. Uh, if you have a story you'd like me to share, you know, maybe you don't want your name out there, but I can kind of, you know, use another name, but obviously you'd let me know. But if you have a story you'd like to share where you, you know, proud proud dad or mom moments, proud parenting moments, or lessons you learned from somebody, your parent or a, 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 another father or mother figure that really had an impact on you in your life. I would love to hear them, and I would love it if you'd give me permission to go ahead and uh, share those. I think that'll about do it, so I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, until next time, take care and have a great day. Thanks for listening. The Way of the Dad podcast is produced and recorded by, well, me, a stunningly average husband and father, who appreciates all of the likes, shares, reviews, and support you give. If you would like to reach out, you can find the podcast on its Facebook page, and of course you can email me at wayofthedadpodcast at gmail.com. Come back next time as we continue to fearlessly dive into the depths of dadness.